There were three ravens sat on a tree Down a down, hey down a down They were as black as they might be With a down One of them said to his mate Where shall we our breakfast take? With a down, dairy, 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 down, down. Hello and welcome to a special Advent 2023 edition of the Three Ravens podcast. My name's Eleanor Conlon and I'm taking a break from shadows for a moment to embrace my inner white knight with my partner in justice and all light arts, Martin Vaux. <laughs> Are we partners in justice and all light arts because today's two turtle doves? We are indeed, and because we're mostly goodies, really. Yeah. Still, dear listener, as you've probably realised by now, we're counting down to Christmas with 12 days of mini episodes culminating in our Three Ravens Christmas special on Christmas Day, with each episode inspired by one of the verses of the 12 Days of Christmas song. And I'll be absolutely honest, aside from their brief appearance in Home Alone 2 Lost in New York, I can't think of any particular stories featuring turtle doves. Well, to deal with the species first, the turtle dove is different to the collared dove, meaning it isn't white. What? So my whole concept of turtle doves is wrong? Yeah, they're called turtle doves because their wings are mottled brown and black, making them look like turtle shells. Oh my God, you're blowing my mind, Eleanor. They are also nowhere to be found in winter really? because they fly south to feed uh, and they, they only return to the northern hemisphere in spring where they nest in hedgerows. Although it's worth saying that turtle doves are now an endangered species. They've been on the RSPB red list since 1996. Oh no, so the world is literally running out of turtle doves. It genuinely is. Ugh. And their distinctive cuckooing is mostly a sound associated with summer. Although, very interestingly, turtle doves are also associated with candlemas and Imic, which we touched on yesterday. Is this to do with the onset of spring? Imic, yes, but in terms of Candlemas, it's a bit complicated. But basically, in the book of Leviticus, it dictates that 40 days after a mother gives birth, they're to offer up a lamb to be burned as a holocaust or burned offering, that's what that word means, along with two turtle doves. Oh, no! Yeah, healthy reminder that the Bible contains quite a lot of terrifying stuff that, if you did it today, would likely be considered black magic. Mm. (laughs) Anyway, in addition to burning the lamb, the mother was then to be anointed with the blood of these two doves, plus holy oil, on the tip of her right ear, the thumb of her right hand, and the big toe of her right foot. And because Jesus was born on December 25th, if you count forward 40 days, you get Candlemas. So Candlemas is the celebration of this totally non-witchy, totally holy and sacred Christian ceremony happening to Mary after the totally non-witchy virgin birth. Correct. And (laughs) this is all to do with purification. So although the turtle doves aren't white, they are still associated with the idea of purity and spiritual cleansing. I mean, when I think about doves more widely, I associate them with peace. Like in politics, for example, politicians who want war are often known as hawks, birds of prey, while those who sue for peace are known as doves and, alas, are almost always pilloried for doing so. Well, looking back to the very earliest recorded myths, namely those of Babylon and ancient Mesopotamia, Inanna, who is, again, a triple goddess, um, an all-mother deity, she was very closely associated with doves, visiting people in the form of a dove and sending doves to carry messages. And just to be clear, how old are these stories? They come from the third millennium BC. So five to six thousand years ago. God, I love how old these stories are. Ancient Mesopotamian mythology is so amazing. And in terms of Inanna, is she a god of peace? Well, she has these three forms, the morning, the day and the evening. Mm. So a bit like the maiden, the mother and the crone. And these were all worshipped distinctly, starting in Uruk and spreading through the Middle East, replacing the deity Asher in the Assyrian Empire, meaning Inanna became the principal deity of Assyria, so she became really, really important. And even more fascinating, in a celestial sense, she was thought to be the planet we know as Venus. So Venus Aphrodite worship grew out of the worship of Inanna. So cool. And so if we're talking about Aphrodite, we're also likely talking about love and unity? We are, but unlike Venus Aphrodite... 
Inanna was the goddess of justice. And in a way, we can kind of see a peace god analogue there. Because mm. she was known to conquer all kinds of kingdoms and empires of other deities, not through war, but Whoa. through reason and debate. I love this, because all of creation in Babylonian folklore starts with Enki, the god of wisdom and creation. And if I remember rightly, he passes this wisdom down to Inanna. He does. So Inanna knows all that is positive and all that is negative. Mm. So she can weigh up both sides and explain the differences and the consequences to others. She appears in more ancient Mesopotamian myths than any other deity, including ones where she debates Anne, the god of the sky, Utu, the god of the sun, and Eresh Kigal, the goddess of death, who we touched on in our demons episode. Yeah, in one story, Inanna goes down into the underworld to debate Eresh Kigal about the wisdom of death. But Eresh Kigal basically hates her sister so much for being so balanced that she does kill her, although it's later arranged that Inanna can come back to life for half the year, swapping places with her husband, Demutsi, the god of shepherds, and her other sister, Geshtinana, who's the goddess of dreams. And between them, you get the cycle of the seasons, basically. Very interestingly, though, in the Hebrew Bible and Old Testament, there are carryover references to Inanna and Demuzi. Yeah. And this is because, of course, parts of those biblical books are carried over from ancient Mesopotamian texts including the flood in the book of Genesis, for example. Now, does a dove pitch up in that one as well, actually, in terms of the flood? Is it not a dove that brings Noah an olive branch showing that the flood waters are receding? It is, although let us not forget that before then, Noah releases a raven. Oh, yeah. Which went, and I quote... Forth to and throw until the waters were dried up from off the earth. Nice. A bit of raven dove teamwork. This I appreciate. Also, in the Celtic and Druidic traditions, doves embody love. Yeah. For example, Angus, the Celtic god of love, and in some traditions, Mabon, the child of light, is surrounded by a flock of doves. He's known to be the husband of Bridget, who we were talking about yesterday, growing from boyhood to manhood to adulthood alongside Bridget across the course of the year, dying and being reborn at the winter solstice. And does Angus also use doves as messengers? He does, and he sometimes transforms into a dove too. So cool, So he has a few things in common with Inanna, actually. (sighs) And if we peel ourselves away from ancient belief, does the dove rock up in many folk tales? I can't think of any myself, but I imagine Aesop has one. He normally is pretty reliable on this sort of thing. He does indeed. It's called the dove and the ant it's very short and first occurs in ancient greece so the story goes one day an ant is beetling about on a blade of grass when a huge looming shape passes by and knocks the ant off into a stream the waters of the stream are flowing quickly and the ant fears it's going to drown but luckily a dove sees the ant in peril so it flies down to help The dove pushes some grass down into the water, enabling the ant to clamber out of the stream and back to safety. The ant says thank you, the dove coos no problem, and the ant scuttles off. Sorted. Only then, the ant sees the source of the looming shape that knocked him into the stream in the first place. It's a fowler out hunting birds, and he's about to throw his net to catch the dove. So being a brave sort, the ant scuttles up the fowler's leg and bites him. The fowler flinches, startling the dove who flies away, meaning the ant and the dove live on while the fowler had to look elsewhere for his supper. That's a lovely little story which tells us one good turn deserves another. Well, quite. And that one recurs a few times in different versions, doesn't it? As the lion and the mouse or the fowler and the snake. Yeah, the dove and the bee. Mm -hmm. It's a perennial favourite, but I have more. Tremendous. The first one is entitled simply The Dove. This one first appears in a 17th century Italian collection. In this one, we start with a poor old woman who lives as a beggar, only a prince rides by her, not looking where he's going, smashing her begging bowl. He's completely unapologetic. He says, I think it's only a bowl, for goodness sake. So the old woman curses the prince to fall in love with an ogre's daughter. Oh, silly prince. The least he could have done was replace the woman's bowl. Well, he didn't. So he rides on. But within hours, he finds himself lost in a nearby forest. And there he finds a young girl in the mud playing with snails with skin as pale as the palest feathers. They fall in love at first sight. 
but the prince is too tongue-tied to say anything. And in that moment, the ogress steps out and immobilizes him using magic. <laughs> the ogress then orders the prince to dig an acre of land and sow it by evening. A curious ogre mating ritual, I presume. But hey, let's go with it. The young girl comforts the prince, saying, Oh, I wish I could use my magic. If I could, I'd help you. Mm. She then explains that normally she's very magical, but the stars in the heavens are in just this position that means it's blocked her from using her spells. Bad luck, princeling. Roll up your sleeves and get to work. Anyway, later that evening, the prince has done his work and the ogress returns, observes it, then tells the prince that the following day he was to fell seven great big trees and split them into firewood. Let me guess, the stars still aren't in the right position. No, no, no they aren't, no. <laughs> but the prince does manage to fell the trees and split them, which pleases the ogress the following evening. So far, so good with yeah. the ogre mating rituals. Mm -hmm. Sadly, the young girl knows that after the third night, the ogress will make the prince her husband. But cunningly, the ogress lays a curse on the prince which is that as soon as he's kissed, his memory will be completely wiped of this girl. Ooh. And all he'll want to do is marry the she-ogre. Oh, drag. So <laughs> the challenge for the third day is to drain a swamp. Ooh. But the young girl says, look, Prince, we need to get out of here. If you don't come with me now, you're going to be married to an ogress. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so she helps the prince out of the woods back to his kingdom. Only as soon as he gets back to the castle, his mother, the queen, gives him a kiss. Oh, twist in the tail! The prince therefore explains that he wants to marry the ogress and the young girl is ejected from the castle as no. the prince no longer remembers who this strange commoner is. Ugh. Still, the queen's happy that her son has at least agreed to be married, so wedding planning gets underway, you know. <laughs> Never mind that the bride's going to be an ogre. But the young girl is panicked about what to do and she manages to get a job in the palace kitchen mm. to try and figure things out. Then, just as the stars re-enter the right places in the heavens, she makes a magic pie that the chef wants to fill with blackbirds, as per our episode the other day. Yeah. But the girl transforms these blackbirds into magic doves. I did wonder when the doves would actually enter this story. Yes, it's, uh, it's taken a while, hasn't yeah. it, to circumnavigate the doves. Yep. The prince then gets served this special dove pie in advance of his wedding as a kind of test to see if he'd like something similar on the day itself, much sure. as people do tastings for their yeah, wedding the breakfast today. Talking about, yeah. Only when he cuts it open... Out fly these doves and the she ogre's spell is broken. And he suddenly remembers this pale girl from the forest with whom he was in love. And though the chef's pretty annoyed because he was expecting blackbirds, yeah. uh, the girl is then summoned from the kitchens for the chef to tell off, at which point the prince and the girl are reunited. Huzzah! And then the prince marries the young girl and the young girl protects the kingdom from the magic of the she ogre. Well, Eleanor, what about the old beggar woman and her begging bowl? It's actually not mentioned again in the what? original story, but I will I'll add a bit. Um, the prince then sees the error of his ways and gives the beggar woman a pension on which to live and buys her a whole new set of matching crockery. Well, wow, that's good. You fixed it. Lovely. But I've got to say, that was not as dove-centric a story as you might expect, considering it's called The Dove. <laughs> no, perhaps not. Unless the young girl is also meant to represent the dove overall, mm. the sort of pale and magical symbol of purification and love and peace, but yeah. it is a little bit of a stretch. More straightforward is For the Love of a Dove, which comes from Central Europe. In that one, there's a king who only has one daughter, and this princess does nothing all day but knitting. Yeah, she sounds all right. Into crafting. Well, she's quite lonely. She doesn't have any friends. She never leaves the castle. And the queen starts to worry. She says to the princess, L listen, why don't you get married? We, we can marry you to a handsome prince or a young nobleman. It's not a problem. But the princess wants none of it and always says no. Yet one day, while she's sitting and embroidering alone in her room, a dove flies in through the window and flutters around her embroidery frame. Oh, sounds promising. The princess takes the bird in her hands, but then lets it go and it lands again. So she strokes it and it coos nicely and gives her an enormous amount of joy. Mm. Only then the dove speaks and asks her, do you love me? That's a bit forward, but there you go. The princess checks her heart and realises she actually does love the dove. So she says, yes, I do love you. So the dove says, if so, put a bowl of milk out tomorrow and you'll see what a handsome man I am. Then the dove 
flies off back out the window. Mm, this is a concerning beginning. It's all rather conditional. If you love me, do this. I am made uncomfortable by this. Well, the next morning, the princess uh, is made uncomfortable. She gets the shepherd to bring her a pail of milk. She pours it into a bowl. Then the dove arrives, has a little bath in the milk. Disgusting, I might add. <laughs> and emerges as a very handsome young man. Ooh. If a little bit milky. <laughs> the princess runs to kiss him. But the handsome man says, oh, no, 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 no. Hold on. Before you can kiss me, I've got two more conditions that you must abide by. See, I think he's a wronger. Just go back to knitting, princess. The dove says, the first condition is that you must never reveal my true form to anyone, not even your parents. The second is that you must wait three years for me to return to a human form. The princess weirdly agrees to both. The young man dives back into the bowl of milk and flies away as a dove. Uh -huh. From that day onwards, the young man visits her every day as a dove. She caresses him, he coos and he always flies away. Two years pass like this. And throughout that time, the queen endeavours each day more and more to persuade the princess to please get married. Good parents, eh? Maybe know. she just wanted her to move out. Yeah, probably. <laughs> the princess, anyway, continues to refuse until she's worn down. And one day she just blurts out, Mother, leave me alone. I'm wed to a dove who visits me daily. <laughs> in a year's time, he'll reveal himself as the most handsome young man you've ever seen. And you'll realise he has no equal on earth. Only from that day on. The dove doesn't return. Oh, well, she's better off without him. There's plenty more fish in the sea or doves in the sky, I guess. But don't worry about it, princess. But she waits day after day, week after week, month after month. <sighs> but all her waiting proves to be in vain. A year passes without the dove appearing, all because she broke her word. Mm. And the princess gets sadder and sadder, weeping and moaning, only knitting black things, <laughs> begging her father to find the dove or else she'll die of sorrow. And her father tries to console her, saying, look, I, I've got a handsome prince and a young nobleman for you. They both want to marry you. Result, take one of them. Forget about the dove. Yes, solid advice from the king there. But the princess refuses, saying, <gasps> it's the dove or nothing. <sighs> so she gets some new shoes made and some walking canes and sets off on a quest to find him. Princess, what are you doing? She's seeking love, Martin. <sighs> shush, shush. The princess leaves the castle for the first time in almost her whole life and wanders for three long years without pausing. And whoever she meets on her way, she asks about the dove, but no one has seen the dove. Meanwhile, the king has the whole palace painted black as a sign of sorrow for his lost daughter. What a bunch of drama llamas, these people. <laughs> I know, right? Eventually, after not succeeding in finding the dove, the princess returns. She's all sunburnt and hardy from her adventures. Mm. And she goes straight to the bathhouse to rest her weary body and have a good shampoo. And then she starts to retell her story to anyone who will listen to relieve her sorrow. And word soon spreads about her tale from a few women, she tells, to all manner of folk, rich and poor, from all across the kingdom. Well, she made some friends, finally. I mean, maybe this is all working out for the best. Meanwhile, in the poorest street of the poorest village in the whole kingdom, a poor girl lives who has nobody. And when she hears word of this story, she decides that she wants to hear it from the princess herself. Before she sets out, she goes to the village fountain to get some water for the journey. Only there she spies a rooster carrying a basket and wearing wooden shoes. What? I mean, this story is going places, yeah. all right? <laughs> <laughs> when the village girl sees the rooster in the wooden shoes, she's understandably amazed yep. and decides to follow it. <laughs> as you would, as you would. And she does, and she follows it with her water jug on her back, spying as the rooster enters a garden and starts to pick fruit and vegetables what? and put them all in its little basket. <laughs> The maiden then follows the rooster onto a cottage in the woods, which the rooster enters. The maiden slips into the cottage and hides in a corner, seeing a large vat of milk standing in the middle of the room. Uh -oh. It's like a nightmare. <laughs> After a while, 11 doves then fly into the room, each diving into the milk and emerging as fine young men, as beautiful as angels. Whoa! A 12th dove then flies into the room. This one doesn't dive into the milk, but perches on the edge of the vat. The 11 handsome young men speak to it, saying, If you were married, you could come with us, but your wife revealed your secret, and therefore you can't turn into a man anymore. Oh. The dove replied, Yes, 
She revealed my secret and I've caused her and her family to paint their palace black and to paint their hearts black. And I've caused her to wander the world for three years in search of me. Oh, boy. Well, at least we have a chance for a resolution here. <laughs> yes. The village girl sneaks back out of the room, rushes to the palace. And after several days of queuing to meet with the princess, she eventually does. And the two young women swap stories. The pair then dash back to the cottage, hide, and when the twelfth dove arrives, the princess rushes out, kisses him, and he transforms into a man once more. Oof. The maiden's then gifted a great fortune, marries a nobleman, and they all live happily ever after. Well, see, now that one is dove-centric, isn't it? And I think by the end of the story, everyone's actually a better person. Definitely. And once again, it's a story about purification, so there's certainly that going on with dove-based fairy tales. Meanwhile, they also sometimes symbolise love and at other times peace. I mean, it seems to me that doves are a bit of a catch-all icon that can mean a few different things at different times for different cultures. I think that's a fair assertion, but still pretty interesting. Oh, very. And thank you as ever for telling me fascinating stories. My pleasure. And tomorrow, it's the big one, isn't it? A partridge in a pear tree. Yep, and then it's Christmas Eve, and then it's Christmas Day. Only two more sleeps till Christmas. Well, we'll be back tomorrow. And in the meantime, while our doves have cooed off that way, we'll go this way. And remember, don't whistle until you're out of the woods. God sent every gentleman Such hounds, such hawks and such lean men With a down dairy day